It's good to see so many of you from so many different countries. My name's Kirsten Aldred and I'm a senior writing examiner for Cambridge English. Welcome to our webinar today on the advanced writing test. To start, I'd like to give you some information about Cambridge Assessment. Cambridge English Language Assessment was established 100 years ago. We are an international exams group and a not-for-profit organisation. We are a department of Cambridge University comprising three exam boards as well as the largest research capability of its kind. We advise governments and NGOs and we partner industry leaders to deliver the best products and services. As you can see from the map, Cambridge English Language Assessment has around 4 million candidates from all over the world. There are two, over 2,700 centres in 130 countries with approximately 20,000 examiners. We're seeing an increase in the number of test takers and recognition for Cambridge English Advanced and the primary reason behind the growth in Cambridge English Advanced is the increased demand for a CEFR C1 level qualification from test takers and universities around the world. Cambridge English Advanced benefits as it is more than just a snapshot of language ability. The exam helps develop the language skills needed for success in study or work in an English speaking environment one exam fulfills both university and visa requirements to the UK and Australia. Cambridge English Advanced is also widely recognised around the world, including by universities in the UK, Australia, Canada, the USA and beyond. The URL on the slide shows where you can go for recognition information on all Cambridge English exams, including Cambridge English Advanced. Here are some more examples of where Cambridge English Advanced is accepted. Cambridge English Advanced is widely accepted for admissions to HE institutions worldwide, as mentioned previously. This includes some of the top recruiters of international students in the UK, Australia, Canada and the USA. The exam has gained formal recognition by many state education authorities, for instance, in Romania, students who have taken Cambridge English Advanced are exempted from the English language component of the school leaving examinations. In Bavaria, Germany, students studying for their abitur in their grammar schools are given the opportunity to take Cambridge English Advanced alongside their school exams. Leading employers also recognise the value of Cambridge English Advanced because it provides proof of high level skills that are suitable for professional purposes. Immigration authorities also recognise the exam's value, not only as a valid and reliable test of English, but also for the high levels of security. UK Border Agency, UKBA, accepts the exam for all types of study, work and spouse visas. The Australian Department of Immigration and Citizenship accepts the exam for student visas. Please remember to tell your students that they can use Cambridge English, that Cam, use Cambridge English certificates to access study and work opportunities worldwide. In the webinar today, we'll give you a brief overview of the task requirements of the Cambridge English Advanced Writing Paper. Then, we'll explore the assessment scales for writing at C1, covering the four subscales and the different aspects of writing that they cover. We'll then guide you through applying the subscales to examples of candidate performance. And finally, We'll present some teaching ideas to help learners improve their performance in the areas covered by the assessment scales. Now, we're going to look at the format and the type of task used in the Cambridge English Advanced Writing Test. In part one, candidates are given some input material, which is up to 150 words in length. This could, for example, take the form of an email. In response to this, candidates could be asked to write an article, a report, a proposal or a letter. They have no choice of question and need to write between 180 and 220 words. In part two, candidates also answer one question but have five options to choose from. They could be asked to write an article, a competition entry, a contribution to a longer piece, an essay, an information sheet, a letter, a proposal, a report or a review. They also have the choice of answering a question on a set text. They need to write between 220 and 260 words. As you can see, at C1 level, candidates are expected to be able to write in a number of different genres. 
This will require them to make decisions about appropriacy of format and register. We'll look at how these are assessed later in the webinar. Now, let's think about what makes a good piece of writing and how this is assessed in the writing test. Before I tell you what I think makes a good piece of writing, I'd like you to answer this question. Type in the chat box the characteristics of a good piece of writing. OK, so if you could use the chat box, then I can read out some of the answers if, as they appear. OK, we've got coherency, um, vocabulary, keeping the reader's attention, fluency, understandable, a range of structure. OK, clear development. There's lots and lots of things coming through. Not boring. OK, um, accuracy and communicative. OK, so you're all saying the right sort of things here. I think a good piece of writing successfully conveys information and ideas, so it tells the reader everything that he or she needs to know. It does this in a way that is appropriate to the target reader, so it may need to be formal, or in language that children can easily understand. It's well organised and clear. It will have a good range of structures and relevant vocabulary, which are used accurately. So let's look at how these relate to the assessment subscales used in the writing test. In the Cambridge English Advanced Writing paper, as well as with several other Cambridge English exams, these aspects of writing are assessed under the four subscales – content, communicative achievement, organisation and language. Let's look at these a bit more closely and see how they relate to the characteristics of a good piece of writing. Okay. Content focuses on how well the candidate has fulfilled the task. In other words, if they have done what they were asked to do. So this relates to the ability to convey information and ideas, our first characteristic of a good piece of writing. Communicative achievement focuses on how appropriate the writing is for the task and assesses whether the candidate has used the appropriate format and register in their response. For example, if they have been asked to write a report, does their writing contain features of report writing and is it written using the appropriate level of formality? This was our second characteristic. Communicative achievement also refers to the writer's ability to hold the target reader's attention, convey more complex ideas and achieve the communicative purpose. Organisation focuses on the way the candidate puts together the piece of writing. In other words, the ability to organise and link ideas logically and clearly. This was our third characteristic of a good piece of writing. And finally, language focuses on vocabulary and grammar. This includes the range of language, so how much variety of vocabulary and structures are used appropriately, as well as how accurate it is. This is our fourth characteristic. These subscales are the same for all levels, but there are descriptors for each level of the Common European Framework of Reference, CEFR, to show what learners at that level should be able to achieve in their writing. Let's look now at the descriptors for C1. In the table, you can see what a C1 level candidate is expected to be able to do to fulfil the criteria for each subscale. Take a minute to read through the descriptors. The descriptors are written for examiners. They don't use the kind of language that teachers use when you're giving feedback to your learners. Let's have a look now at how these descriptors relate to teachers' comments about students' work. Now, look at this teacher's feedback on a piece of student writing and decide which subscale the comment relates to. Is it content, communicative achievement, organisation or language? If you can use the poll facility to put your answers in rather than the chat box, then we can get the graph again and we can, we can have a look and see how many people can get the right answers. OK. If you can choose your answer now. And the answers are coming through. OK. Yep, we've got the poll through there now. And you're right. The teacher is commenting on the learner's use of language. Note that this learner is accurate. But at C1 they need to also show a wide range of grammatical structures and vocabulary to achieve the level, including words which are not so common. 
OK, now look at the teacher's feedback in number 2. Again, decide which subscale the comment relates to. Is it A. Content, B. Communicative Achievement, C. Organisation, or D. Language? If you can choose, use the poll, polling buttons again, and then we can, we can see where you are. OK? There are some answers coming through on the chat box. OK, there's a few more coming through. OK, so we have C there. The comment is about organisation. This includes how a learner organises their ideas so that there is a connection from one idea to the next. At C1, they're expected to be able to do this competently. Organisation also covers paragraphing and the use of linking words and structures to link different sections of text. At C1, they should be able to use a range of these fairly appropriately and effectively. Now look at feedback number three. Again, decide which subscale the comment relates to. Is it A. Content, B. Communicative achievement, C. Organisation, or D. Language? Again, use the polling buttons to select your answers. OK, there's some answers coming through on the chat box again. Ooh, getting a range of answers this time. OK, but the majority is right. It's A, content. Content covers whether the learner has included all the main points, as well as how relevant the learner's ideas are. At C1, they should be able to support their ideas and develop the main points so the target reader is clear about the writer's point of view and would therefore be fully informed about the subject. So, the last comment, remember you are writing to a close friend, some of the language you have used is very formal, is about communicative achievement. At C1, learners should be able to select and use appropriate register and communicate their ideas effectively. So far, we've looked at the band 3 descriptors for C1. The band 3 descriptors represent performance which is at the target level of the exam. Each subscale is divided into bands from 0 to 5. Let's now have a look at the other bands and how they work. We'll start by comparing some of the descriptors to see how they reflect different levels of candidate performance. These are the descriptors for organisation at bands 1, 3 and 5. Start by reading the descriptors for bands 1 and 3. There are at least two differences. What are they? Could you write your answers into the chat box, please? OK. OK, so we've got flexibility generally, not just linkers but linking devices, that's a good point. Um, organisational patterns, so there's different language in, within the different descriptors. Um, coherent whole, which is in the, the five band, just using generally to good effect. OK, so you can see the difference there. As you've noticed, there is more than one thing to consider when comparing bands. At band 1, the text is generally well organised, like many of you said, and coherent, while at band 3 there's no qualification. It should be well organised and coherent without any exceptions. At band 5, the text is a well organised coherent whole, which again some of you mentioned, and it's clear that the learner has thought through the complete structure of the text rather than just linking one idea to the next. The other key area of difference lies in the use of cohesive devices and organisational patterns. At band 1, the learner is using a variety of linking words and, but, so, and cohesive devices such as as a result of this, although perhaps not always appropriately. At band 3, the candidate is using organisational patterns, for example, whereas some people, others, or grammatical or lexical patterns in addition to cohesive devices and these are being used to generally good effect although there may be some inappropriate or inaccurate use. 
At band 5, the learner can use these same kinds of cohesive devices and organisational patterns with flexibility. So at this band, the learner would be selecting language carefully to give the text cohesion and to link their ideas in the most appropriate way to achieve their aims. Now, think about the wording of the descriptors. Are they positively phrased or negatively phrased? Can you type your answer into the chat box, please? OK, we're getting lots of answers through straight away. And everybody is saying positively. These help us as teachers to give positive feedback on what our learners can do. In addition, by looking at the higher bands, learners can see what they need to be able to do in order to get a higher band. As you'll have noticed, there are only descriptors for bands 1, 3 and 5, and these relate directly to the CEFR levels. In this case, band 1 is B2, band 3 is C1 and band 5 is C2. However, learners don't move neatly from one level to the next, as you know, and a learner may often show different abilities in different areas of the subscale. You may find that your learner's writing shares features of band 5 and band 3, and in this case, the candidate would be awarded a band 4. So, bands 2 and 4 are appropriate for answers which combine features of the bands above and below. Now, let's have a look at applying some of the criteria. First, please look at the handout you received before the webinar and read through the question. It comes from part 2 of the writing test. Please type yes in the chat box when you have finished reading. OK, lots of yeses coming through. That's good. <laughs> OK, now look at the sample answer. Read it through and decide what you would give it for content, keeping the descriptors in mind. They, these are also on your handout and please type yes in the chat box when you've finished reading the sample answer. OK. Do you think the reader is fully informed? Type your answer into the chat box. And what mark would you give it for content? Again, type your answer into the chat box. OK, we're getting a few yeses through and a variety of numbers for the bands. We're getting twos, threes, fours, ones, so a range. OK. OK, that's interesting to get all those numbers through, but in fact this script was given a three as the target reader is on the whole informed. So what do you think the candidate has left out? Let's have another look at the question. You can look at this on your handout or on the screen. OK. Can you type your answer into the chat box? What has the candidate failed to answer? OK, we're getting some answers. Why we give presents. Commercial pressures not mentioned. Why we give presents. What makes a good present. Um, social pressure. OK, remember we're just looking at content here. OK, only Christmas, not general. What makes a good present. OK, well, the candidate explores the, the social reasons why presents are given and touches on the side, on the idea of what makes a good present. It should be something personal and shouldn't be too high for one's budget. However, he or she does not develop this point and explain why this factor is important. It is mentioned and relevant, but does not fully inform the target reader about their opinion. The candidate could also have explored the commercial reasons for giving presents, as you mentioned, uh, for giving presents at Christmas time, but this is not mentioned at all. Therefore, the reader is on the whole informed rather than fully informed. OK. Now let's look at the same part to answer again and think about the other subscales. Let's start with communicative achievement. It will help you if you have the handout to refer to. On page 3 you can see the C1 assessment scale which you can use for this task. Think about the answers to the questions and use your answers to help you decide which band to give. 
So, think about, is the register appropriate to the genre? Is the reader's attention held? And are complex ideas expressed? When you're ready, when you've thought about those ideas, type your answers into the chat box. Okay, again we're getting a variety of, of answers here. We're getting twos, threes, a couple of fours. The register's okay, somebody's put. Okay. Right. Okay, some more threes, fours, ones, twos. So again, we're getting a range of answers. Okay, so let's check the answers to these questions. Is the register appropriate to the genre and is the reader's attention held? Yes. The writer uses an appropriate heading and he or she tries to engage target readers by addressing them as dear readers. The register is consistently appropriate for the genre of article and your attention is held as you read. Okay. Are complex ideas expressed? No. There are some opportunities to develop more complex ideas, but they are missed by the writer. So this answer gets a band 2 for communicative achievement, as there are no complex ideas which are required for a band 3. Right, let's move on to think about the organisation subscale. Think about the answers to the questions I've put on the screen, which are also in your handout. Is the text well organised and coherent? Are cohesive devices and organisational patterns used to good effect? Use your answers to help you decide which band to give and try and find examples from the script again to show why you made your choices. OK, we've got some answers coming through already. We've got twos, threes, fours. Again, we've got a range. Somebody's given a five and a one. So I think we've had every, every um, band there. OK, let's check the answers. Is the text well organised and coherent? Yes. The response is well organised and coherent, despite having too many paragraphs. There are a number of ideas which could be combined better to make a paragraph with a clear central topic. Are cohesive devices and organisational patterns used to good effect? Not really, no. There is a variety of linking words, firstly, secondly, yet, and cohesive devices and referencing. It is this factor which. However, the use of it borders on the repetitive when in fact ellipsis would be more natural, yet everyone does it. So, we can't really say that they are used to good effect. So, this answer gets a band 2 for organisation, as the writer has some elements of band 3 and some of band 1. OK. Finally, let's think about the language subscale. Think about the answers to the questions in your handout and on the screen, and use your answers to help you decide which band to give. Is the Lexis always appropriate? Are there many grammatical errors? And do they impede communication? When you're ready, type your answers in the chat box. OK, again we're getting bands coming through, twos, threes, ones. Nothing much higher at the moment. Too many errors, somebody's pointed out. Uh, there are errors, but you can understand. OK. Well, let's check the answers to these questions. Is the Lexis always appropriate? No. Although the writer uses a range of vocabulary, including some less common Lexis, cost a fortune, counts the most, he or she doesn't always do so with accuracy, as in give away presents. Let's move to the next question. Are there many grammatical errors, or any errors in general? Yes. The writer uses mainly simple grammatical forms with some complex structures, such as relative clauses and the use of the gerund in after receiving. There are a number of errors, such as thank you for, the, thank you for everything you have done, and frequent spelling errors, but, really, creats and reservoir. However, these errors are not considered impeding, so this answer would get a band 1 for language, as the Lexis is not always used appropriately and there are only some complex grammatical forms. The errors are not occasional, as you'd expect for band 3, although they don't impede communication. So, if we bring all of these bands together, we can see how the candidate did overall. 
OK. You may have noticed that the answer we've been looking at was a little under the recommended word range for Part 2 tasks. You may be wondering why this was not mentioned by the examiner in his or her comments. In fact, there are no automatic penalties if a candidate produces an underlength answer, but it may still have had an impact on the assessment. First of all, it may mean they haven't covered all the content. The answer you just looked at only got a band 3 for content because the ideas were not fully developed. But even if all the content is covered, it could still affect other subscales. If you look at these, you may find that other aspects of the subscales are not covered in a very short answer, and so the candidate will achieve a lower band for these. For example, if it's a report, they may not have introduced or summarised their points as you would expect in this, this genre, so affecting communicative achievement. Or, they may have omitted cohesive devices, or used very simple ones, so affecting the band for organisation. Or perhaps, in a limited sample of language, they might not have shown a good range of more complex structures or lexis. In the same way, there are no automatic penalties for answers which are too long, but the bands for the subscales may be affected. For example, there are likely to be irrelevances in a long answer, which can affect the band for content. The reader's attention might not be held effectively, which could affect communicative achievement. The writer can take the opportunity to use a range of vocabulary and grammatical forms, but trying to write too much in a limited time could lead to more errors, which could affect the band for language. So even though we don't have automatic penalties in the assessment scales, they do allow for weaknesses which may be evident in a candidate's answer. The key thing to remember is, look at the subscales. By referring closely to the descriptors and matching them to the learner's performance, we can allocate the best band for each learner's strengths and weaknesses. It's really important to tell your students not to waste time counting words in the exam. What they need to do is to practice writing, thinking about the assessment scales, checking they have covered all of the content. They should also practice writing in a time limit so they can produce an appropriate answer in the time available in the test. One other question that is often asked is whether an assessment of a script is affected by poor handwriting. Again, there is no automatic penalty, but it is important for candidates to write clearly. If a piece of writing is totally illegible, it will be impossible to mark it at all. If parts of it are illegible, then an examiner may not be able to see whether all content points are covered, or may miss examples of language that could raise the answer to a higher band. It's important to give your students plenty of practice at writing fast and, and legibly, so give them time limits and make it clear in feedback if you find their answers difficult to read. Remind your students that it doesn't matter whether they use lower or uppercase, or whether they use joined up writing or not. Right, so we've considered the subscales quite carefully and started to think about some of the problems that learners can have. Now think about your own students. Which areas do they have most problems with? If, do they have problems with covering content, communicative achievement, organisation, language, or perhaps it's writing too much or too little, or poor handwriting? If you can type your answers in the chat box, I can see some of you have already done that. So we've got language, grammar, content, organisation, complex ideas. Um, what else have we got? Range of vocabulary writing too much, register, reading the question, okay, register, complex ideas, and again for C1 the complex ideas is actually very important, um, coherence and language, collocations, okay. So there's a few things there to think about. You may find some ways of helping them as we go on to look now at the classroom ideas, okay. We're going to look at some ideas for preparing your learners for the writing test. For each idea, decide if it would be particularly useful for helping learners to improve their writing in terms of content, communicative achievement, organisation or language. Use the poll facility on the left of the screen and choose your answer now.
Okay, the cement is coming through in the uh, chat box, but if you could put them on the polling buttons, then that would be great. Okay, we're getting some answers, some more answers through on the chat box. Okay, as most of you have said, the answer is D. Language. You could also give learners a text with repetitive use of vocabulary or grammatical structures and ask them to make it more interesting. This can help their lexical and grammatical range. Now look at the second idea. Which area could this help learners with? A. Content. B. Communicative achievement. C. Organisation. Or D. Language. Again, use the poll facility on the left of the screen and choose your answer now. Okay, we're getting some answers through on the chat box again. If you could use the poll buttons, that would be great. OK, fantastic. The majority of you said A, content, and that's right. You can also train learners to always underline the keywords in the question so that they're sure that they cover everything in their response. OK, here's another idea. Which area could this help your learners with? Choose your answer A, B, C or D. And again, use the polling buttons rather than the chat box, please. OK, we're getting some answers through on the chat box. Again, a bit of a range. OK, but the majority, you're right, it's B, organize, uh, B, communicative achievement. Of course, learners can also change a text from formal to less formal or change an email into an article, and so on. Make sure you give learners a target reader when they write, as this helps them to be able to picture who they're writing for. Here are the three ideas we've looked at, plus one more. One final idea which can help with organisation. You could also delete some of the structures which create cohesion in a text, such as verb tenses. An alternative way to do this is to ask learners to identify the words to delete. This can really help them to think about how a writer has organised their text. Now, let's look at one classroom idea in a bit more detail. This is to prepare your students for part one of the writing test, where they have to write in response to an input of up to 150 words. It will help them to look carefully at the input text, include all the key points for content, to think about the target reader and type of writing for communicative achievement, to think about the use of cohesive devices for organisation, and proofread their writing for language, and also to consider the effectiveness of a piece of writing as a whole. Here's what you do. Give students a sample part one question from the handbook. Ask students to read the input and to think about what they would write in their answer, making notes under the following headings. The target reader, the type of text, the purpose for writing, points to can include, register and functional language, for example, apologising. 2. Then, give students a sample answer to the question from the handbook and check it against their notes, for example, is it the right text type, etc. 3. Focus them specifically on the functional language used and the cohesive devices or linkers. Ask them to think of alternatives. 4. Ask students to proofread a sample answer in pairs for any errors and think about the effectiveness of the writing. 5. Ask students to write their own answers to the question. And then finally, Students then swap answers and give feedback to a partner. When they give each other feedback, you can encourage them to focus on different aspects of writing, such as organisation, and not just grammatical accuracy. So, in this webinar we have looked at the content of the writing test, 
the assessment scales, including exploring the differences between the bands and some practice in applying the subscales to learners' writing, and some teaching ideas to help improve learners' writing. I've had some good questions through. Um, one of the things that seems to be coming up quite often is, com is about complex ideas. Um, now, in the C1, in the uh, CAE writing paper, you have um, the content that you have to develop. And I think it's this area of development of the points. So instead of just mentioning what, what the question is asking for, it's actually going that little bit further and relating the development of the ideas very firmly back to the question. So, for example, in the sample paper we looked at, it was looking for the idea about when we give presents. And you can talk about lots of different things there and relate it to the social concept and the commercial aspect of giving presents as well. So it's not just about the complexity of language, it's about the complexity of ideas to get the... Um, to develop the points and I think that that's what we mean by complex ideas and sort of developing the answer as much as you can not just from a personal aspect but maybe from a more general perspective as well I hope that answers that point um, we also um, had a question about the conventions of the communicative task now this is quite important um, and I think it goes back to the point that I made in the webinar whereas if you've been asked to write a report that you actually use features of report writing within the task. So, for example, it could be something very straightforward, such as headings, which are still allowed, and we still would like to see them, just maybe not for every separate paragraph. Um, but, it's, it, but it's not just about using the simple features, the external features of report writing like headings, but it's actually using the language of the passive voice, for example, and to... Um, to use the language that's applicable in that scenario. So if you were writing an article, you might want to write it in a more neutral style rather than a very formal style. So it's thinking about the genre and thinking about the register and thinking about who you're actually writing for. And this is all part of the communicative task. Um, and in that respect, that's what we're looking for, for the conventions of the communicative task. So if you're writing a formal letter, you would use very different language to writing an informal letter. OK, so I hope that answers that question there. Um, somebody else has asked about a positive effect. How do you create a positive effect? Well, I think particularly if we think about letters, if you've been asked to write a letter to somebody, and, or a, a letter of application, for example, um, if you really want to get that job, you are going to have to create a very positive effect on that on that reader. And I, and I think that... So if they have asked you to supply information, you supply information in a, in a, in a way that's actually um, maybe respectful or um, quite within the terms of, of, the, of the letter itself. So I think that what I am saying is that you probably wouldn't be boastful, but you would, be, you would set out your achievements in a way that's appropriate. OK? And that would create a good effect on the target reader. Um, OK. Somebody has asked about overall coherence and where that is assessed. Is it assessed in content, communicative achievement or organisation? Generally, coherence would be assessed within the organisation subscale, um, but sometimes it can have a knock-on effect onto the communicative achievement. For example, if we think about a report... Um, if the information it jumps around, so they talk about one aspect and then they move on to something else and then they, go, then they return to the first subject, then that would lack overall coherence and it wouldn't make the report very easy reading. So it may be assessed in both scales because it, one has an effect on the other. The same can be said for language as well because language sometimes can affect the content. If the language is very weak sometimes that affects the, um, the, um, how well the target reader is informed because they, if they can't break through the errors then sometimes they, it can lead to them not being fully informed but being on the whole informed. Okay, we um, had a question about how long 
would we give them to write the answers? Well, the test itself is one hour, 30 minutes, so you're looking at 45 minutes per question. So I would give them practice at writing for 45 minutes within, and to try and get to the word count and covering all the points. OK. Um, we've also got um, a question about, is there a source text for um, a source for texts with errors, and I think Pippa has answered that question, so I hope you've got the information there. There's one question which I think that some people have asked as well, which is the overall mark for the script that we saw. Now that mark was, that script was given 3, 2, 2, 1, and in the new assessment scales, that's the mark for that script. Previously, they were given one mark, so they were given a band 3 or a band 4 for the overall um, script. Now what happens is each separate aspect is given a separate mark and then that's translated into um, a mark that goes forward with the rest of the um, papers for the CAE um, test. So that would be combined with the marks for, write, for speaking, listening and reading. So, the marks, so when you're looking at a piece of student writing now, you need to be looking at it in, in terms of content, communicative achievement, organisation and language, and score it using the bands that we looked at today. OK. Um, what else did we have? We had... How do you um, develop the ability to include complex ideas? And I think that I've, I've covered that a little bit, but I think to develop that, I think it's more practice. You just have to give practice at writing the, uh, getting the candidates to think about what else they can say about the topic. And I think that planning is quite important in that, in that view. So it's not just going straight into writing about, uh, they see a question and they panic and they write. It's about giving them time to think about how they can incorporate those, these ideas and how they can link things to not just their own personal experience, but maybe to the wider, the wider scene. OK. Um, we've also got paragraphing and topic sentences, huge issues. Again, it's practice, and paragraphing is quite important because it does give you um, that idea that one paragraph contains one idea. And it can go back to these complex ideas as well, where you have um, a paragraph is not just one sentence or two sentences, but it's a, it, it's a, it's a, uh, a section of text that deals with one idea in quite a bit of detail. And this is what we're looking for as we move from B2 to C1, this more development of the topic and of the ideas. OK. Um, I think that's probably all the questions that we've got for now. So what I'd like to say is to thank you very much for attending today and we look forward to seeing you at our future webinars. So thank you very much and goodbye.